couple of guys. Let me just mention a couple of guys who are with us this morning. If I don't mention your name, don't feel bad. You know, just know that you're still included in part of our service. I see Mona, I see Naomi, Martin Theory, Jacob Barina. I see Raphael. Raphael, I trust you well. Kerry, uh, Christine. Uh, let me take maybe two more guys over here. Uh, Lisa as well. I see you and uh, Eunice Muthengi. So guys, uh, thank you so much for joining us for service this morning. We are really happy to have each and every one of you. Hey, I can see Will and Laura, of course. Uh, where's Eleanor? Is she hiding somewhere there? <laughs> yeah, but guys, it's, uh, it's really nice to, uh, to be able to see you guys at least uh, somehow uh, have church happening like this uh, online. So um, allow me to spark this word of prayer. And then uh, even as we get into the service, Lord, we thank you for allowing us together again now. Uh, as brothers and sisters in the faith and god we commit this time that we have to fellowship together to sing songs of praise to you to worship you in psalms uh in songs and um uh lord we pray that uh, you would be with us may you come and just fill our space and our time together may you lift up our spirits uh, may you minister to each and every one of us to a point of need lord um and uh, may this is uh, may this just be a great time of worship in jesus name we pray amen Allow me to read a scripture over here even as we get started the service. And I'm going to read a quick one over here from the, uh, from the book of Psalm chapter 8. As we were praying earlier, I felt that this is a good scripture for us to consider. Uh, and Psalm chapter 8 says that, Lord, our God, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and, in and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies. You silence to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. What is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. For you have made them a little lower than the angels and you have crowned them with glory and honor. You have made them rulers over the works of your hands and you have put everything under their feet. All the flocks and the herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swims in the path of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And we are grateful that, you know, God would love us in such an amazing way uh, that he would, um, you know, constantly pour out his love in our lives. That even though he has made us a little bit lower than the angels, yet he still considers us as his wonderful creation. Even though sometimes we are caught up in our own sinful ways. Uh, I do have a quick, uh, um, two quick announcements on to let you guys know before we get into uh, a time of song. And worship with Victor now. Uh, first thing is uh, we're going to do service like this for the next for the entire month of April as we continue to wait for the government, uh, you know, to to direct us about what's going to happen in the month of May. As we all know, we are in lockdown 2.0. So, but for us as a church, we're going to be meeting on Zoom like this for service uh, for the entire month of April. And then the other thing I'd like to encourage all of us is please, you know, let's continue uh, gathering and meeting together in our home groups online. Um, at least we keep the fellowship going, we continue praying for one another, encouraging each other and uh, lifting up uh, one another before the Lord. So we are going to continue meeting online right here on Zoom for the next entire month of April. And the second thing again that we want to encourage all of us is let's continue again uh, meeting together, gathering uh, online uh, for our home groups. Indeed. And it's really nice to see each and every one of you. And right now what I want to do is go ahead and hand you over to uh, our wonderful gentleman who's been leading us in worship through uh, and doing an amazing work. His name is Victor. Vic, Chukulia Tafadali. Thank you. Uh, amen. Um, even as we just celebrate God's goodness and his victory for us, I'd like us to, to uh, acknowledge this even in singing. Um, he has beaten death. Greatest day in history, death is beaten, you have rescued me. Sing it out, Jesus is alive. Empty cross, the empty grave, life eternal, you have won the day. Sing it out, Jesus is alive. He's alive, and oh, happy day, happy day, you washed my sin away, oh, 
be day, be day. I'll never be the same. All right. We're going to sing that again. Um, from my end, I can see that the, the PowerPoint is still being uh, set up. One more time. The greatest day in history. Death is beaten. You have rescued me. Sing it out. Jesus is alive. The empty cross, the empty grave. Life eternal, you have won the day. Shout it out. Jesus is alive. He's alive. And oh, happy day, happy day, you wash my sin away. Oh, happy day, happy day, I'll never be the same. Forever I am changed. When I stand in that day, when I stand in that day, free at last, meeting face to face, I am yours, Jesus, you are mine. Endless joy, endless joy, perfect peace. Ugly pain finally will cease. Celebrate, Jesus is alive. He's alive. He's alive. And oh, happy day, happy day. You wash my sin away. Oh, happy day, happy day. I'll never be the same. Forever I am changed. One more time, happy day. And oh, happy day, happy day. You washed my sin away. Oh, happy day. Happy day, I'll never be the same. Forever I am changed. And oh, what a glorious day. And oh, what a glorious day. What a glorious way. That you have saved me, and oh, what a glorious day, what a glorious day, oh, happy day, and oh, happy day, happy day, you washed my sin away, oh, happy day, happy day, I'll never be the same, oh, happy day, happy day, you washed my sin away, oh, I'll never be the same. Forever I am changed. Forever, forever I am changed. Truly a glorious day that he saved us. Uh, and it's because of this that we sing he has won the victory. By 
by his stripes we are healed by his nail pierced hand by sin thou hast done victory the power of sin is broken the power of sin is broken jesus over gave me all he has won our freedom he has won our freedom jesus has won it all now we sing hallelujah hallelujah you have won the victory hallelujah you have won it all for me cause death could not hold you down you are the reason he seated in majesty you are the reason he. one more time hallelujah hallelujah you have won the victory hallelujah hallelujah you have won it all for me death could not hold you down you are the reason seated in majesty you are the reason he by his blood by his blood we're washed clean now we have the victory the power of sin is broken jesus overcame it all he has won our freedom he has won our freedom jesus has won it all hallelujah sing with me hallelujah you have won the victory Hallelujah, all for me. Death could not hold you down. You are the reason, King. Seated in majesty, you are the reason, King. Our God is risen. Our God is risen. He is alive. He won the victory. He reigns on high. Again, our God alive. He won the victory. He reigns on. Our God is risen. Our God is risen. He is alive. He won the victory. He reigns on high. Hallelujah. You have won the victory. Hallelujah. 
you have won it all for me cause death could not hold you down you are the reason he seated in majesty you are the reason amen he's risen amen and thank you very much victor for leading us through that time of worship and um again it's really nice to see all of you welcome to lovington vineyard church or uh, sunday service it's really nice to have many of you who are joining us this morning for the church service we do appreciate it uh do remember that this is live it's not recorded uh in case the video glitches you know it's because of internet connection so it's way beyond any one of our control uh but let me say a quick shout out going out to a couple of families that i can see over here richard i see you michelle i see you as well thank you uh, Dr. Caroline Mungai, I see you as well. Thank you. And uh, Aiden Matoke, I see you as well. Nishant Das, I can see you guys. Hi, Lillian. Uh, Ebere and uh, Katie and Sony, we see you guys. So thank you so much for joining us for the service this morning. And uh, what we're going to do right now is go straight into the Word. And uh, we do have some two lovely girls who are going to read the scriptures for us. Uh, and uh, we, the scripture for today comes from the book of Luke chapter 24. Yeah, if you can go in your scriptures, um, go to Luke chapter 24, verse 20. Uh, from verse 13 to verse 35. That's what we'll be reading from. And uh, Zara together and Alba are going to be reading the scriptures for us. So, girls, are you ready? Yes. Yes. Okay. They walked to Emmaus. That same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, a seven miles, seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed, these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them, but with them, but God kept them from recognizing him. He asked them, What are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short, sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about the things that have been ha that have happened the, the the there the last few days. What things? Jesus asked. The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth. They said he was a prophet who did powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be commented, commented to death and they crucified him. We had, we had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to who had come to to rescue Israel? This happened three days ago. The the same. Then some woman from our group of his followers were were at his tomb early this morning, and they came back with an amazing report. They say they said his body was missing and they had seen angels who told them jesus is alive some of our men ran out to see and sure enough his body was gone just as the woman had said then jesus said to them you foolish people you find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures wasn't it clearly the scriptures no, wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from the scriptures the things concerning himself. By the time they were nearing Emmaus, Emmaus and the end, of their journey 
at the end of their journey, Jesus acted as if he were going on, but they begged him, stay the night with us since it is getting late. So he went home with them as they sat down to eat. He took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to them. Suddenly their eyes were opened and they recognized him at that moment. He despaired. He despaired. He disappeared. They said to each other, Didn't our hearts burn within us, us as he talked as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us and within the and within the hour they were on their way back to Jerusalem. They found the eleven disciples and the others who gathered the gathered with them who said the Lord ha has really risen. He appeared to Peter. Then the two from Emmaus told their story of how uh, how Jesus had appeared to them and as they were walking along the road and how they had recognized him as he was breaking the bread. Thank you very much, Zara and Alba. And um, I'm going to uh, hand you over to Debs. She's going to be sharing the word with us. Uh, Debs. Good morning, LBC. It really is a pleasure to be with you all this morning and to gather, uh, even though it's over Zoom, just that sense of being together with each other in God's presence. And how amazing is it that we can be in God's presence, uh, even in this way together. Um, for anyone who doesn't know me, my name is Deborah. I'm one of the elders. I have the privilege of serving alongside the others at LVC. And it really is great um, to be here this morning and to have this opportunity to share from God's word. Um, we continue this morning in the book of Luke, uh, the third part of our series. And as you've just heard the girls read, we are in Luke chapter 24. And today we're going to be considering God's truth. Um, and, and truth is an interesting concept in 2021. Um, we're overwhelmed by conspiracy theories, uh, drowning in opinions uh, put forth as gospel truth. We have every piece of information at our fingertips, thanks to Google, yet so often to find, we struggle to find what is true. Mose and I had to spend considerable time this week convincing one of our children, I won't name which, but convincing her the mermaids were in fact not a real thing. She was convinced that if Google said it, it must be true. You may have heard the saying before, knowledge is knowing tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is not adding tomato to your fruit salad. We're surrounded by knowledge, but truth so often seems elusive. And today, as we consider this passage from Luke 24, we're going to ponder on God's truth. How often we struggle to see it, even when it's right in front of us, revealed to us in unexpected ways and unexpected moments, God's truth burning in our hearts. And we're going to consider four things. God's truth revealed in unexpected places, God's truth revealed in darkness, God's truth burning in our hearts, and God's truth revealed in intimacy. But let's pray together as we start. Lord, we do thank you for this, this time and space, this opportunity that we have to gather. Thank you that despite everything that's going on around us, we, we can gather around your word together. And we pray that as we do so, you would open our hearts, that you would open our minds, that it would only be you who is revealed to us. That as we ponder these words, this scripture, as we ponder the life of Jesus, his death and resurrection, and all that that means for us, that we would see you, that we would see you more clearly, that we would hear your voice, and that you would speak to each of us in a special way. Use this time we have together this morning, Lord, just to open our hearts and our minds to what you have for us. Make your word clear and just help us uh, to understand as we come together this morning. 
And we pray these things in your name. Amen. So I did my undergrad degree at University of Glasgow and I studied theology. And I remember many of the entertaining quirks of various lecturers and professors from one who I won't name, who completely bored us by standing in front of class week after week, reading word for word from the systematic theology textbook that he himself had authored and forced us all to buy. To the one that was so disorganized, he never seemed to get to his point. To our New Testament Greek lecturer, who we were all convinced was constantly intoxicated. But some lecturers really stuck in my mind. And they stuck in my mind because they spoke very clearly as people who had encountered Jesus. They had lived faith, not just taught it. They had battled with the hope of the gospel, not just written textbooks on it. And I'll never forget one class in particular with uh, Professor Peter Nielsen. And he was a practicing pastor as well. And in this class in particular was sharing stories of his ministry in Edinburgh's nightclubs providing water, prayer, and safe spaces for young people. Now, Scotland has a rather intense party and binge drinking culture, uh, which is often, unfortunately, renowned across the world, and often seem to be as far from church as one could possibly get. Intoxication, promiscuity, drunkenness, drugs, and worse. But Peter and his team saw their calling to be to create spaces for young people to find God, and find Jesus in these places. Finding God in places where people least expected to find him. People who perhaps would never find themselves in a church. People who found themselves, thanks to Peter and his team having encounters with Jesus in some of the darkest of places. Encountering Jesus in the most unexpected ways and the most unexpected places. And I think that's the first lesson from today's text. On the road to Emmaus, we see God's truth revealed in an unexpected place. As the two friends on this road to Emmaus began to chat with the stranger they had met along the way, we hear them recount the events of the last few days. In verse 22, they mention that some woman from their group reported Jesus to be alive, risen from the dead. Verse 22 says, then some women from our group of his followers were at his tomb early this morning, and they came back with an amazing report. He said his body was missing and they had seen angels who told them Jesus is alive. But despite this report, followed by Peter himself going to check out the tomb and reporting it empty just as the women had said, these two men on the road to Emmaus still did not expect to see Jesus. He was an unexpected com companion on that road. We're not entirely sure who these two men were other than that they were among Jesus' disciples. We're not even sure where Emmaus is or why they were headed there. We do know that they were confused, devastated by Jesus's death, left questioning and wondering. There were reports of Jesus's body missing, but they were still leaving town. There was a glimpse of the truth, a hint at the resurrection of Jesus, but they seemed to have ignored it, to be moving on, headed out of town. It seems like they were ignoring the truth and the power of the resurrection because they didn't yet recognize it as truth. They didn't yet recognize that as part of God's plan. But truth came to them in unexpected ways and they met truth that day in an unexpected place. The result, they didn't realize they were in the presence of truth. They didn't realize that Jesus was the one stood in front of them. That Jesus, the answer to every question and doubt they were so busy discussing, was right there beside them. They did not expect to meet Jesus there. They did not expect an encounter with the truth on the road to Emmaus. They didn't expect it, and so they did not see it. They didn't recognize Jesus when he was standing right in front of them in intimate conversation. And I wonder, where do we ignore Jesus because we don't recognize him? When do we encounter Jesus and his truth, yet we don't see it because it's not what we're expecting? And I wonder, as we all might, what clouded their eyes to this extent? When they bump into this stranger, Luke tells us in verse 17, he asked them, 
what are you discussing so intently as you walked along? They stopped short, sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all these things that have happened there the last few days. You can almost hear the, the shock and surprise and wonder how on earth could this man not know? But what strikes me from this verse is the phrase, sadness written across their faces. That's from New Living Translation and NIV, their faces were downcast. Their sadness was intense. They were overwhelmed with grief. If you've ever lost a loved one, someone close to you, you may recognize that darkness of grief and of loss. Many in this COVID season have been grieving and know this only too well. Sadness that is so heavy, so overwhelming, that you can't see anything else. For some of us, maybe it's just the sense of despair that has been so characteristic of the last 12 months. A sense of loss, the reality of long, periods of unemployment, of prolonged loneliness, of seemingly meaningless isolation. These two men on the road to Emmaus felt so overwhelmed by their own darkness that they could not recognize Jesus standing right in front of them. Jesus was no stranger to them. They were amongst his followers, his disciples, yet they did not recognize him. All of their hope over the last two or three days had been seemingly dashed, completely destroyed. And they carried the weight of that disappointment, the weight of that confusion. Their hope, as far as they understood it, was literally dead and buried. And so we get to the second reality of God's truth from this passage. God's truth revealed in the darkness. God's truth is still truth, even in the darkness. God's truth is still truth, even when we're overcome with despair. God's truth is still truth in our loneliness. Whatever darkness we might be facing, God's truth is still present. Jesus was with them. They were consumed by darkness, overwhelmed by sadness, but none of that changed the fact that Jesus was actually there. He walked with them. He talked with them. He taught them. They had not yet seen the fullness of God's truth in those moments, but Jesus was very much there and very much real. And perhaps you can look back on times of darkness in your life. And now looking back, you can see Jesus walking alongside you on the road. But in the moment, the reality may have been that you did not see it. You could not see Jesus with you in the midst of your darkness. Our own sense of darkness and despair can blind us to the reality that Jesus is right in front of us. The two men couldn't see past their own darkness, their own limited understanding of the situation. And so they did not see Jesus. Where do we struggle to see Jesus? Because we're so stuck in our own limited understanding of our situation. Interestingly, these two men are able to look back later. Once they realize they've been walking and talking with Jesus, their risen savior, and they recognize him in what had seemed like darkness. Verse 32, towards the end of the passage says, they said to each other, and this is after Jesus has been revealed to them, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. They found the 11 disciples and the others who were gathered with them. And they said, the Lord has really risen. As they looked back, back on their darkness, on that journey on the road, they were able to say to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us? They knew there was something special. As they looked back, they could see the presence of Jesus with them. They knew the burning in their hearts on the road was due to the presence of Jesus, the presence of God's truth. And that brings us to the third reality of God's truth. God's truth burns in our hearts. 
as the truth of scripture was revealed to these two men by the truth Jesus himself, their hearts burned. I had a look for other passages that spoke about hearts burning, and I couldn't find any that seemed to use this phrase in the, the same way. But I imagine a burning heart is, is one filled with passion, excitement, energized to learn more and do more. If you've ever had heartburn, you'll know it's something you can't ignore. It literally burns in your chest. You can't lie down comfortably, you can't sleep, you can't rest. You're forced to act, to do something, to respond to the burning. Think on this burning in their hearts and compare it to Jesus's words to the men whilst they were still on the road. In the men's sorrow and darkness and their failure to understand the realities of scripture and the truth of God's plan, Jesus says to them in verse 25, how foolish you are and how slow to believe. Or in the New American Standard Bible, oh foolish men and slow of heart. In the message, it says so thick headed, so slow hearted. They were slow of heart, almost the complete opposite of these burning hearts as Jesus unpacked, as Jesus taught them, as he walked them through the scripture. This passage tells us Jesus started at the beginning with the book of Moses and went on through all the prophets, pointing out everything in the scriptures that referred to him, to Jesus. And as he did so, their hearts began to burn. They went from this place of foolishness, of, of slow heartedness to burning hearts alive with the message of God's truth. As Jesus taught them, as Jesus revealed himself as truth to them, their hearts began to burn. Have you encountered Jesus through scripture or through a conversation or on a journey in a way that made your heart burn? Can you remember a time when you heard God's truth in a way that seemed to set your heart on fire? I'd encourage you today to seek out an encounter with Jesus, an encounter with God that sets your heart on fire. Join a home group, reach out to us at LVC, find a friend to study scripture with, pray that God would set your heart on fire. In this passage, we see Jesus unpack story by story the truth of God's word as they walked down that road. God wants us to see Jesus to see his truth woven through history. Those of you with young children may be familiar with the Jesus Storybook Bible, and Jeremy made reference to this a few weeks ago. But it so beautifully puts it, this phrase, every story whispers his name. Every story from Genesis through Revelation whispers the name of Jesus, whispers God's truth to us. God wants us to see his plan for our redemption, for our restoration. He wants us to see his plan for love and rescue woven through every piece of every story in the Bible. One of my university lecturers used to say that the difference between Christianity and other religions was very clear. In Christianity, truth is a person, not a book, it's not a set of rules, not history long gone. It's a person, the person of Jesus. In John 14, 6, we read, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus himself was God's living word. Jesus himself was God's truth. And therein lies something important for us today. As Christians, as Christ followers, our greatest desire should not be for truth written in a book or for the longest set of rules that best represents 2,000 years of teaching. Our greatest desire should be for the person of Christ, the one who redeems us, the one whose name is whispered from Genesis to Revelation. Truth personified, love personified. God's written word is important, but it points us to Jesus. And as we search for that truth, the story of the road to Emmaus holds valuable lessons. Truth revealed in unexpected places. Truth with us in the darkness. Truth that sets our hearts on fire. 
Now we're going to try something uh, a little bit different this morning. And we're going to take a pause here and head into breakout rooms together. And we have four breakout rooms and Chiro, if you need it, this is your cue to get them up and running. And we have four wonderful leaders leading some discussions in our breakout rooms this morning, just reflecting on, on some of these uh, insights into the passage in Luke 24, thinking about where we see Jesus in unexpected places, where we find Jesus in our darkness, and the times that we felt Jesus set our hearts on fire with his truth. And we're going to come back in about uh, 10, 15 minutes um, and just reflect on one final insight from this passage. Um, but right now, uh, you're going to go into breakout room, and I, I do hope and pray that it really just is a time of, of sharing, of reflection, uh, a meaningful time of just continuing to be together around God's word. So uh, if you're not familiar with Zoom breakout rooms, you'll see a pop-up on your screen that says you're being invited to a particular breakout room. You should just need to hit yes, and the rest will happen automatically. And at the end of the time, you'll automatically come back to this main room. If you have any issues at all, just join again using the original link. Um, and I think you'll find one or two of us here in the main room ready to point you in the right direction. So Shiro, I think, are we ready to go? Thumbs up. Okay, thank you, everybody. See you in a few minutes. Encouragement to you would be to keep those conversations going, um, whether with the same group or with others. I keep digging into those scriptures and digging in to God's truth. Um, and indeed, share with us your, your thoughts, your questions, your reflections. Um, use our Facebook page, speak to your home group, just keep opening up those conversations. Now we, we are out of time. I'm going to ask you to stick with us for about five minutes longer just as we wrap up. Um, and, and I do want to come to our, our fourth and final thought for today. We've considered God's truth in unexpected places, God's truth with us in darkness, and God's truth burning in our hearts. And now in conclusion, we consider God's truth revealed in intimacy. Verse 30 says, as they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it. There he broke it and gave it to them. Suddenly their eyes were opened and they recognized him. It was in the breaking of bread that they recognized Jesus. Now what struck me as interesting as I dug into a number of commentaries and try to understand this passage is that these two disciples were not present at the last supper in Luke 22 when, when Jesus broke bread uh, in the kind of initiation of the, the sacrament we know as communion. And this was not, so this was not necessarily reminiscent of any previous experience with Jesus, nor was this necessarily the sacrament of communion, communion as we know it. It was a simple supper. It was a meal to end the day and refresh the travelers after a long journey. But the meal table is a place of intimacy, a place of hospitality. And throughout the gospels, we see Jesus sit down for a meal with people who leave transformed. Jesus seems to speak love and truth as he eats with others. Jesus reveals himself as truth as he gathers his loved ones around the table. I feel extremely blessed to have grown up in a family and in a church community where food was a big deal. I often joke that food is my love language, but growing up, it was indeed the language of welcome, the language of grace, of hospitality, and often the language of Jesus. Gathering around a table, whether for a simple cup of coffee or a three course feast was a time to share the depths of our hearts, a time to meet with God's truth and a time to see Jesus revealed. A good friend from my childhood, now a pastor, wrote a blog post about the meaning of a simple meal table. He grew up in the roughest part of Scotland and I'll share the link to his blog so you can read the full thing. But until he came to church, he shares that the concept of a dining table, the concept of a shared meal in which people spoke to and loved on each other was a foreign concept. In fact, in the blog, he describes his first encounter of his shared meal around a table at the age of 11. 
and describes it as perhaps some kind of cultic ritual. Soon his own household acquired a dining table and meals became family time, a time to share so much more than just food. And in the blog post, he goes on to write, there was so much more to this change than changes in table etiquette, nor was that what my mum was interested in. A meal consists of so much more than food. We began to talk as a family. Reflecting on it now, I see how that table helped my mum reconnect with her children at a deeper level and during a time where she may have been at risk of losing them. Guests would join us around our table too. Neighbours, school friends, people from church and even a stranger from time to time would be welcome to join our microwave feast. Some would even stay longer into the evening. Some, if they needed it, were offered a couch to sleep on for a night. I remember several people for whom that sofa became their bed for weeks on end. Our table, he says, became not just a place of deep connection, but a springboard into a life of hospitality. That story he shares has not only shaped me deeply, but illustrates some of what I think Jesus understood to be so powerful about tables. I'll share the link as I say, and I, I've sat at that very table on many occasions growing up and can testify to the truth of what he shares. And these two men from our passage today, they recognize Jesus seeing him as if for the first time as he breaks bread, the intimacy of a shared meal. God revealed in, in the fullness of all of his truth in seemingly the most simple of things. Truth once again revealed in an unexpected moment, in an unexpected place, in the most humble of ways. God's truth revealed is, is not a bunch of words or a string of sentences. It's an intimate encounter with the living word of God in Jesus. Jesus talked to them on the road. He explained scripture. He laid out word for word, chapter by chapter, why he had to die and rise again. He chastised them for their lack of understanding to the point that their hearts burned. Yet they did not recognize him until they sat together to eat. It was in that moment of intimacy that God's truth was fully revealed. By sitting intimately with the person of Jesus, they finally see and understand the truth. How can we sit so intimately with Jesus? How can we invite Jesus to our tables? How can we invite others to our table so that they can encounter Jesus, encounter truth? Philip Yancey wrote a book a few years back called Finding God in Unexpected Places. And in the book, he says this, the traces of God can be found in the most unexpected places. An Atlanta slum, a pod of whales off the coast of Alaska, the prisons of Peru and Chile the plays of Shakespeare, a health club in Chicago. Yet many Christians have not only missed seeing God, they've overlooked opportunities to make him visible to those most in need of hope. LVC, let's not miss opportunities to find and share God's truth. God's truth is real, even in the darkness in the most unexpected of places. God's truth is present. God's truth is for us, in our darkness, burning in our hearts, in intimate moments around a meal. And my prayer for us today is that we find Jesus in each of those places, that we see God's truth and that that truth becomes all of the reality, all of the things we need for every season of our life. Let's pray as we welcome Victor back to sing a final song. Lord, we thank you for your truth. We thank you for your truth revealed in the person of Jesus. That unlike every other religion, as we interact with the truth of your word, we're interacting with our living, risen Savior a savior who, who loves us to, to such a great extent that we can't even imagine, a savior that continues to reveal himself to us today in every season, 
even in darkness, in unexpected places where we least expect this, and in intimate ways as one who loves us in ways we cannot imagine. I pray for each person here, for each person in LVC, that even just in this week, even just today, they would have that experience of an encounter with you, that they would have that intimacy with you where they can share around a meal table the truth of your word, the truth of your salvation. Reveal yourself to us, we pray. May we find your truth. May we know your truth. May we speak your truth and share it with others. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. Victor, over to you. All right. Um, even as we just think about this truth, Jesus is with us in, in the most unexpected situation, present even in the darkness. Mm -hmm. That gives us hope that someday we will rise, even despite what we are facing today. There's a peace I've come to know, though my heart and flesh may fail, there's an anchor for my soul. I can say it is well. Jesus has overcome, and the grave is overwhelmed. The victory is won. He's risen from the dead. And I will rise when he called my name. No more sorrow, no more pain. I will rise on the God, fall on my knees and rise. I I will rise. There's a day that's drawn with me to light, and the shadows disappear, and my faith shall be. My eyes, Jesus has overcome, and the grave is overwhelmed. The victory is won, He is risen from the dead, and I will rise. When he calls my name, no more sorrows, no more pain, I will rise on the eagle's wings before my God, fall on my knees and rise, I will rise. And I hear the voice. And I hear the voice of many angels sing. Worthy is the Lamb. And I hear the cry of every longing heart. Worthy is the Lamb again. And I hear the voice of many angels sing, worthy is the Lamb. And I hear the cry of every longing heart, worthy is the Lamb. And I will rise when he calls my name. No 
more sorrows, no more pain. I will rise on eagles' wings before my God. Fall on my knees and rise. I will rise. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Victor. And thank you, Debs. Church, it's been such a joy to be with you. This experience of togetherness helps me personally to overcome any kind of Zoom fatigue. And so I hope you enjoyed the breakout rooms. If you're not in a home group and that gave you a taste of a home group, even through Zoom, I really hope uh, you give it a shot because it's a great place to connect during this really difficult time. And but speaking of to connect, I want to invite Shiro to put up the, the prayer room uh, link for those who want to pray with someone. We have our prayer team available to pray with you. There's a waiting room so you can pray with someone in privacy. But we even had someone just this morning reach out to one of the elders asking, how can I be born again? And so whether that's you or you have any other need, we would encourage you to join that uh, prayer team to have some time of prayer with them. They would love to do that with you. So church, as we close this Zoom service, receive this benediction. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church, to him be the glory in Lavington Vineyard Church, and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Love you, church. Go in peace. Feel free to wave at everybody as you sign off. But we'll look forward to seeing you next week, same time, 10 a.m. on Zoom. God bless. See you guys. Hey, everyone. God bless. Bye-bye. Hi, Shy and Eli. All right, I'm going to go ahead 